Hey everybody, it's Miss Colligan, and I am here to talk to you about one of my favorite books, which is Half Magic by Edward Eager. He actually has a number of books in, it's not really a series, more like a group, and they intersect in interesting ways. Uh, some of them involve time travel, and so some of the children from those stories use their time travel magic, or not deliberately, but they get pulled into this time adventure and it crosses paths with the, student, with, with the children who are in these other adventures. And so it's very interesting and the stories intersect in interesting ways. And some of them are independent um, and Half Magic is one of those. You can read it all by itself. I don't think it's the first one in the series. Uh, according to this, uh, the list at the beginning of the book says Knight's Castle. Maybe that one comes first. I don't know. Don't really remember. But in this one, um, there's not really a discussion of magic things having happened before, as there are in some of his other books. And uh, one of the things I really like about this is what's called the diction, which is the word choice, the phrasing, the, the types of words that are used. It makes it feel old-fashioned-ish, but not like super old-timey. Like it's not really historical fiction, but I'm going to read little pieces of it here and there. Um, such as just a little bit from the very beginning, which is chapter one, called, appropriately enough, How It Began. It began one day in summer, about 30 years ago, and it happened to four children. Jane was the oldest, and Mark was the only boy, and between them, they ran everything. So, I mean, you just kind of get, you know, names like Jane and Mark are kind of ordinary, and, you know, sort of, cons not like conservative in the, in the political sense, but just sort of you know, nothing special about them, kind of old-fashioned. Um, skipping ahead a little bit, so they, they like to go to the library. This summer, the children had found some books by a writer named E. Nesbitt, surely the most wonderful books in the world. They read every one that the library had right away, except the book called The Enchanted Castle, which had been out. And now yesterday, The Enchanted Castle had come in, and they took it out, and Jane, because she could read fastest and loudest, read it out loud all the way home. And when they got home, she went on reading. And when their mother came home, they hardly said a word to her. And when dinner was served, they didn't notice a thing they ate. Bedtime came at the moment when the magic ring in the book changed from a ring of invisibility to a wishing ring. It was a terrible place to stop, but their mother had one of her strict moments. So stop, they did. And so naturally, they all woke up even earlier than usual this morning. And Jane started right in reading out loud and didn't stop till she got to the end of the last page. There was a contented silence when she closed the book. And then, after a little, it began to get discontented. Martha broke it, saying what they were all thinking. Why don't things like that ever happen to us? Magic never happens. Not really, said Mark, who was old enough to be sure about this. How do you know? asked Catherine, who was nearly as old as Mark, but not nearly so sure about things. Only in fairy stories. That wasn't a fairy story. There weren't any dragons or witches or poor woodcutters, just real children like us. They find a coin. And it's a small coin. I think they think it's a nickel. But as it turns out, it's not. They sat there and couldn't think of anything exciting to do, and nothing went on happening. And it was right then that Jane was so disgusted that she said right out loud, she wished there'd be a fire. The other three looked shocked at hearing such wickedness, and then they looked more shocked at what they heard next. What they heard next was a fire siren. Fire trucks started tearing past, the engine puffing out smoke the way it used to do in those days, the chief's car, the hook and ladder, the chemicals. So they go running off, and when they finally reached the house where the trucks had stopped, it wasn't the house that was on fire. It was a playhouse in the backyard, the fanciest playhouse the children had ever seen, two stories high and with dormer windows. You all know what watching a fire is like, the glory of the flames streaming out through the windows and the wonderful moment when the roof falls in, or even better if there's a tower and it falls through the roof. This playhouse did have a tower and it fell through the roof most beautifully with a crash and a shower of sparks. And the fact that it was a playhouse and small like the children made it seem even more like a special fire that was planned just for them. And the little girl the playhouse belonged to turned out to be an unmistakably spoiled and unpleasant type named Genevieve with long golden curls that had probably never been cut. So that was all right. I just, I love the, the way it captures 
the way that middle grade kids tend to think. You know, there's still a sense of, you know, well, we wished for something and it wasn't very nice, but it happened to a little spoiled brat and it's not like anybody got hurt. So that was fine. <laughs> so there's a sense of justice there. Um, so of course it's the coin that's magic. And so what happens is that's why the book is called half magic because the coin is just a little coin. It only grants half of a wish, but it takes them a little while to figure this out. So Jane has the coin, but they don't realize it's the coin that is making magic things happen. And they're all sort of upset with Jane because clearly she is the one who had the wish and she is like wasted one of their three wishes. If they get three wishes and they're all unhappy with Jane, including Jane, who doesn't really know what she did or why it happened. So Catherine says, I don't think Jane's magic at all. Only she's afraid to make a wish and find out. I'm not. I am, said Jane, not very clearly. Only I don't know why or how much. It's like having one foot almost asleep, but not quite. You can't use it and enjoy it. I'm afraid to even think a wish. I'm afraid to think at all. If you had ever had magic powers descend on you suddenly out of the blue, you would know how Jane felt. When you have magic powers and know it, it can be a fine feeling, like a pleasant tingling inside. But in order to enjoy that tingling, you have to know just how much magic you have and what the rules are for using it. And Jane didn't have any idea how much she had or how to use it. And this made her unhappy and the others couldn't see why and said so. And Jane answered back. And by the time they went to bed, no one was speaking to anyone else. What bothered Jane most was a feeling that she'd forgotten something and that if she could just remember what, she'd know the reason for everything that had happened. It was as if the reason was there in her mind somewhere if she could just reach it. I'm skipping ahead to my favorite part of the book and I'm gonna share that with you. And then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit and go from there. <laughs> oh, here we are. This morning, everything was so gloomy and strange that Martha, who I think is the youngest, felt the need of comfort. She sat down on the floor, leaned her head back against the open door of Jane's closet, took Carrie the cat in her lap and stroked her. Martha felt a wish for companionship. <sighs> oh dear. If only you could talk, she said to Carrie. Perks, said Carrie the cat. Wow, Merglitz. Fitza. What? said Martha, startled. Wow, Merglitz, said Carrie. Whittle, with ooze. Oh, said Martha. Oh! She got up, dropping Carrie rather heavily to the floor and backed away, white with horror. Foo, said Carrie resentfully. Idgewit, at her. Mark appeared in the doorway. Are my roller skates in here? He demanded. Jane borrowed them last week when her strap broke. Martha ran to him and clutched him. It's that magic. I've got it now, she cried. I wish Carrie could talk and now listen to her. Carrie chose this moment to put on unoffended silence. See, that's how you can tell that she's a cat. Bushwa, Mark said gruffly. He'd found his roller skates in Jane's shoe bag and was putting them on. That old cat. She always was crazy anyway. As usual, Vets, said Carrie suddenly. Mark looked surprised. Then he shook his head in disbelief. That's not talking, he said. Probably just having a fit or something. But I wished she could talk. And then it began, like Jane yesterday. Just a coincidence, said Mark. Yesterday, too. I don't believe in that old magic. Just Jane being smart. Just a lot of crazy girls. So he leaves, and Martha looks at Carrie. Did you say something? She inquired politely. It a little backstick, said Carrie. Wah! Ooh! Pow it's a grandpa! Martha fled the room, calling for Catherine. So anyway, I'm not going to set it down, but it's just, it's got this delightful, playful, um imaginative and I, I it's it's difficult to describe to find words for it but it's just it's lighthearted and fun <sighs> goodness knows we need that right now oh my goodness the challenges that they face are you know it's not heavily melodramatic you know the family's healthy and uh, they get along with each other most of the time they spat here and there but you know they care about each other and it's really sweet. The illustrations inside, let me see. I don't know who they're by. Do, 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 do. Illustrated by N.M. Bodecker. The illustrations inside are quite nice. Again, kind of old fashioned y, like that. Um, the cover that I got on this one, which is uh, her heart, is quite like, I love his art. It's just so 
offbeat. And I've got one of uh, presumably Martha and Carrie on the back. Both of them look uh, su- suitably upset by what has happened. <laughs> and so it continues that way. And of course, they're trying to figure out how the magic works and why it works the way it does and what they can do with it. And of course, being, you know, good kids, they want to do something good and heroic and they try and it doesn't always work out. And it's just very sweet and heartwarming and kind of reassuring in a way. It's a book that's nice to read when, well, like, like I said, like now, when I don't want to think too hard about anything because, you know, it's a kid's book. And uh, I want everything to turn out well, and I want little chuckles here and there, and I want something that's comforting and familiar. It's like, it's not like ice cream and cake. It's not quite that fluffy, but it's like jam on toast. You know, something small, nice, and comforting. And that is what makes this one of my favorite books, Half Magic by Edward Eater. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Leave me a comment because I love it. I would love to hear about one of your favorite stories, whether it's a book or not. Uh, It could be a movie or a television show from when you were young, something that has stuck with you and you went back to it and you found out that not only did it not suck, that it was just as lovely and delightful as you remembered it from when you were young. So share your stories with me and I will see you next time. Bye, everybody.